Hello and welcome to Avid Tech Talk, a discussion with and for media creators. This is the inaugural podcast. My name is Ray Thompson. I'm Senior Director here at Avid for Partner in Industry Marketing, and I want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time to listen today. So what is Avid Tech Talk and what are we going to focus on? Well, if you think about the last 30 years, we've had quite a few uh, technology inflection points, certainly things like the advent of the nonlinear editor brought to you by Avid, for example, or the shift to HD or the migration to file-based workflows. Those are all very important things that have happened over the last 30 plus years, certainly in this business. But over the last probably five to 10 years, you've, we've really seen just a significant sea change uh, based on uh, sort of initially the digital disruption caused by consumer habits changing, wanting content delivered to any device, anytime, anywhere, right? Um, which has caused quite a bit in terms of ripple effects throughout the business, right? Both operationally and economically. And then you think about over the last few years, how the acceleration in the shift towards things like cloud technologies and IP uh, to really facilitate a distributed workforce um, has also caused significant change and the acceleration of adoption of technologies across the board in order to support an ever-changing sort of dynamic, right, in the business, right, which is, seems like it's changing every single day. And so this podcast is really meant to focus on various different technologies and trends that are happening in the business today, while at the same time looking forward toward things like NFTs, the metaverse, uh, blockchain, and how those are in the future going to further influence our business. And so we're aiming to speak to a variety of folks uh, throughout the business, whether they be actual content creators themselves, people creating the technologies used by content creators, or folks who are studying what's happening in the business, um, and bring those folks to you today and going forward so you can learn from them uh, as we have and uh, and just talk about the various different things that are driving change. And we're fortunate enough today on episode one to have none other than Josh Stenauer, who is the principal analyst at Devon Croft Partners. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, Josh, first and foremost, thank you so much for being a part of this today. We really appreciate this. Um, do you mind just sort of introducing yourself to the audience? My pleasure, Ray, and thank you for having me. So Josh Steinauer, I'm here with Devon Croft Partners, so a research firm focused in the media technology sector. You'll find us run, wandering around industry trade events and getting involved in fascinating discussions as like what we're setting up to have. And uh, so we, we you know, principally publish two large annual syndicated research reports, one on the demand side where we're going out and surveying the buyers and users of technology, which is uh, goes by the title of the Big Broadcast Survey. Uh, Avid, of course, and Avid's products are, are featured prominently in that. And then also, we have been responsible for authoring the market sizing reference for the industry. So how big is it? How has it been growing? How have you know segments been interacting here? And that is across the workflow. So we've been doing that. But I think at a more general level, we have great and candid discussions with the suppliers of tech and great and candid discussions with the users of the tech, uh, which puts us in an interesting kind of middle ground to be a impartial observer. That's great. I mean, obviously it's fantastic for all of us because you know it's not like there's a, a broad amount of available information when it comes to things like what you guys are doing, which is providing information about the market, right? From both the business side and the supply side, as well as what you know the consumers and or customers, right? In this case, broadcasters, yep. post houses, right? Need, want, right? Their behaviors, all that. So it's for us, it's fantastic. Um, and that's obviously why we have you on today, because uh, when you think about what's been going on over the last couple of years, right? I often think, you know, as someone who's been around for quite some time, you know, we used to marvel at like some of the technology inflection points, right? The shift from standard def to HD or the shift from sort of, uh, you know, analog workflows to digital workflows or file-based workflows even, right? Um, that was certainly pushed by yet another somewhat tragic event many, many years ago, right? Um, so when you think about those versus what's happening today, right? It just feels like there's so many things that are going on at once, right? And it's almost hard to fathom. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind commenting to start, you know, what is Devin Croft seeing and hearing from the folks that you talk to on a regular basis in terms of trends? That is a lovely way to frame it, right? Because I think mo most things are understood by drawing some comparisons to our own personal experience. When you think of things like, you know, analog to digital or SD to HD, or even say file-based, 
Yeah, the I think the the gains, at least as they're perceived by end users, were were rather incremental or linear, right? If you were going to like plot them on a chart, so I I think of the the interesting times that we now enjoy. I, I would describe this current level of technology, and and I think a lot of the business practices that are riding on the backs of this technology, it's like a, a singularity and what uh, kind of the new levels of value they can drive for the business. So I, I'll be pulling us in this direction throughout the conversation. So I'll go there right now. When, when I think about the most impactful development in our world, I, I actually don't think of a uh, you know specific technology. I, I think of this ability now with the tools that now exist and the practices that now exist for technology end users to actually understand you know their technology operations and that performance in an objective manner and and as important to be able to communicate it to non-engineers which is something historically that hasn't been possible and what what that's going to unleash um th- th- that's where i think we're just going to see un- incredible gains uh and and okay so what has been driving that i mean clearly i would cite the cloud or or just virtualization more generally that is making that available but I, I don't want to get lost in this this data component of what's now coming out of the systems and how that can be used. Because to me, that is that that is the story. Yeah, that's getting lost. Yeah, yeah agreed. And and I think uh, certainly all the uh, events that have been going on around the world have certainly forced I think uh, everyone's hand right in a way that maybe they weren't necessarily quite prepared to act upon. Right. But I give kudos to the industry and the vendors because the way in which companies have been able to pivot over the last few years in order to not only uh, maintain business continuity, but as you said, adopt what by and large were a lot of existing technologies out there to embrace a distributed workforce and really keep television and film going at a time when it was certainly way more challenging to do so is, is really nothing short of amazing. And, and, and so it, if I may, just to add emphasis there, one of I, I think maybe the lasting develop or maybe the lasting realizations is maybe the right word is look at, look at how the past two years and all the continuity initiatives you talked about how that's highlighted the value of tech and investment in tech where his historically whether or not we want to admit it it was really more thought of as a cost center and it added values by added value by costing less and now here we had an opportunity where it was really held up on a pedestal and shown what it could do in enabling the business. And, and to me, those, those are things that, that at least on, I would speak in, in a matter of opinion here, that the technology side of the industry should really, we should capitalize on, we should continue to push that forward. This is a moment in time that, that I don't know how temporary these things are, but we, we should really grasp this opportunity to, you know, hey, let's have different discussions as it pertains to budget. Hey, let's have different discussions as, or a different seat at the table, if you will, in the industry. And, and, and anyway, that's why I kind of come back to that's, to me, the most impactful development that's happening in our world. Yeah, agreed. And and uh, this has affected, I think, the the way in which media companies as a whole, broadly, right, are looking at sort of the uh, you know go forward planning uh, around really all infrastructure, right? Period, um, including right deploying uh, in the cloud, hybrid deployments, certainly, um, and how that is affecting their workflow and their workforce, right? In some instances, right, we've seen, for example, in broadcast news and sports, there's been a, sort of a return, if you will, to the office, right? People have certainly gone back into the building, if you will, right? And they, and yet at the same time, they built out this infrastructure and these capabilities to enable all of this remote work to happen. So they now have this almost outer layer of capability they can turn on and off whenever they want, right? Which uh, they really didn't have before. They had to build that out in order to, again, maintain business continuity. Whereas in post, we, fee, we see more of a uh, an embrace of the distributed workforce, right? People are building out even further to enable folks, uh, you know, on the post side of the world <clears throat> to not only work effectively from home, but give them even more of what they used to experience in a, in a traditional brick and mortar facility, but do so at home and be much more effective, right? <clears throat> Yeah. And um, so it, here's where I hope I'm embarrassing some product managers within Avid. So, you know, as some of the survey work we do, we had actually worked with um, Avid and, and I guess adjacent to that, the Avid Customer Association with the vote in 2020. So we're kind of right in the teeth of the disruption. This is late 2020, early 2021. And if you, you looked at the buyers of Nexus as they were asked to rank 
uh, feature importance, especially as it pertained to the workflow with Nexus, because there was a couple of different categories of storage you were looking together there. If you look at the document that was published then, I would encourage kind of listeners to go look at it because the ACA has put it into the public domain. All the workflow top sort of ranked features that they were hoping to move forward in the R&D roadmap were all about, you know, distributed working together, you know, hybrid workflows with the cloud. Clearly, uh, and okay, it'd be great if we had the the perfect A-B test, you know, prior to March 2020. Right. I think we can safely say through our own anecdotal observation that really did accelerate that. Now, I, I think the the subject the subject of distributed workflows, and, and you were kind of teasing it through there. Maybe the most visible aspect of that is is this almost uh, work benefit of having the option to be remote or to come into the office. But but to me, if I go back to my original point and kind of understanding workflows and value. We can start to, instead of just thinking about that being a benefit, and I don't want to minimize that, is just we can start to understand the productivity of our workforce. And that really should be how we're measuring technology. And and we're now able to measure that. And I've heard some things kind of casually tossed around of people seeing, say, doubling of productivity of their workers is in a post environment. If I were that individual, I would, you know, I would make much more noise about what has just been accomplished. I think that's an unbelievable uh, statistic, and you hear these things just kind of casually discarded. No, 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 no. You got to take credit for that. Would be my kind of Great. guidance. I know I'm going off on a little tangent here, but you, you, that to me is kind of the bigger story. Not the hey, are we going to come back to the office? But look at the, what is being unleashed in terms of productivity from these distributed workflows. Yeah, no, it's uh, it is it, it's amazing, and and there's all kinds of other benefits around it, right? There's environmental benefits, right? People aren't getting in their cars, aren't having to work as much as they yeah. used to, right? There's uh, certainly work life balance things that are certainly benefiting people. There's for the media companies now a much broader uh, access and pool of talent they can pull from, right? Because you don't necessarily need to live within proximity to the facility in order to basically work for a company, right? You can now take advantage of all these things that are sort of accelerating as we speak, right? Um, and, and be able to work almost anywhere now, right? And that has really changed, right? We've seen that just broadly throughout the pandemic, but certainly, you know, specific to our industry, right? People moving to smaller towns. I don't have to live in LA. I don't have to live in New York. I don't have to live, live in Atlanta. I can pretty much live almost anywhere and I can still be winning key bids for jobs that I like to do, right? Editing and, and doing so remotely. Yeah. And if if I, maybe I'm speaking my book too much here, right? But of all the, the benefits that you just cited, those are all standing on the top of a technology investment that was made. Yep. So why are we evaluating technology investments solely in terms of cost would be that that's the renaissance we need to move towards. So yep. let's stop talking about petabytes and terabytes and cost per unit. No, no, no. Look at all the goals you just didn't like, Hey, carbon footprint. A lot of companies have ESG mandates that they're working yeah. towards. Yep. If this technology investment is going to get us closer to that goal, it needs to be evaluated accordingly. It needs to be given credit for that. We need to you know, advance that on the roadmap. So, so all, all the things you're talking about, you know, how that's starting to influence what we buy, what we deploy, how we take credit for it. To, to me, again, I come back to that to me is, is the, the joy of living in 2022 in our industry is we've gotten out of this Hey, is it an incremental, um, you know, step up from the prior version? Is it a little bit cheaper? We, we've broken from that. So I come back to my point about the singularity. The other, the other and, I, and I agree with that. I think that's right on. And I think the other interesting aspect to all of this is, uh, as all this has been going on, certainly, you know, uh, OTT oriented platforms and sort of consumer demand, which was already like, that was the topic, right? If you think back to the pre-pandemic, that was the topic, digital disruption, uh, you know, the consumer demand for content delivered to any device, anywhere, anytime, and what that was meaning to companies and how they were thinking about, right, their go forward planning, right? And all of that certainly has been accelerated significantly because during the pandemic, there was such a huge spike, right, in people subscribing to those services, not that there already wasn't uh, a massive audience for those services already. Um, but that competition has also led to an increase in production. Um, which means, you know, more content, right, at the end of the day. Um, typically, certainly in television and film, that's that means high-resolution content um, for the long-term preservation and reuse of that content, right? And then there's also the, the uh, on the broadcast side, just an explosion of content in terms of user-generated content, right, that's being used now to sort of augment news stories and or IP content, which sort of lowers the barrier to be able to sort of do contribution from anywhere. 
do you, you know, and a lot of this is reflected honestly in, in a lot of your, your, your studies as it relates to buying the decisions and, or just, you know, what people are thinking about from a technology perspective. I mean, are you seeing those types of things, right. When you talk to, uh, you know, other, other companies, right. Yeah. And I, I guess a lot to take in there. I'm, I'm somewhat of a contrarian where I, I doze off when people start quoting, you know, subscription totals or consumer figures, stipulated more content than ever more sources than ever sure but i i think more interesting um in, in that environment you look at how broken say the model business model of post-production had become yeah. uh, because, because because of how inefficient it was and, and there's like a variety of factors involved in that but you know in a in a universe where you have all this production growth you know a naive view would be like okay well if we do things the same way we'll you know, if, if, you know, the production of content goes up 10 X, we need to grow storage 10 X, but maybe even more than 10 X, right. Because it's at higher resolutions or shoot ratios go up. Right. But instead the, the ingenuity of the actual end user and, and in part because the necessity that their, their budgets weren't growing kind of 10 X uh, you, you had to take other approaches and you had to develop efficiencies. And so, I, again, I, maybe I'm I'm kind of always coming back to the to the same point. I think it's it's been actually remarkable some of the um, you know innovation that's taken place in workflows and kind of revisiting you know how much you know content do we have to keep from the cutting room? How uh, w- what is the business model that's supporting some of these uh, you know next generation uh, resolutions on these new platforms? And and we're asking the tough questions and we're getting to you know acceptable answers. So. Kind of a, a long way to say that the, the more interesting story to me than all these up and to the right charts about subscription totals and viewership is, is the fact that the technology industry has been able to support that without really material increases in the, the technology budget, which I, which I would argue should happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. That's a great insight too. And, yeah. um, and to that end, I think you mentioned, right, the business model, right? And yeah. and have you seen over the last couple of years, right, there's been a lot written, I think, about people embracing as a service, uh, you know, style models. I mean, what, are, what, what does Devin Croft see from, from its customers? So, so I, I think the switch, so if you just look at kind of the, the, uh, the payment model, say CapEx for the OpEx, cause that's the easiest to talk about, but I think it, it obscures some of the, the interesting aspect. There's this kind of presumption that where there's going to be this swooshing sound as everything moves to OpEx. I, I don't see a lot of evidence of that coming from uh, data. I think, in, in fact, if you look at your more traditional customers, it's a very gradual drift. Um, newer customers that come in that don't have leg- legacy are m- more easily able to embrace OpEx. You know, and part of your question there was, okay, is everything going to move to, say, SaaS deployment models? And, and again, it's it's a much more gradual shift than I think is, is commonly appreciated. Now, I, I tie all of those, you know, topics into a much more intelligent, approach to budgeting, which is emerging inside of customers. Uh, and, 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 and that to me is, is kind of, I guess, shades of what I talked about originally. If you can now have these objective understandings of your operations, well, that, that is going to go hand in hand with a different relationship with finance. I, I, I do want to say on, on the vendor side of it, a very interesting thing because the, the coin of the realm for storage was always uh, tying pricing or tying the installation to just the amount of storage that was actually going to transact. And, yep. and it's actually refreshing to see it move away from that, that we're appreciating these other aspects. Maybe we're even pricing on these other aspects and, and these other aspects that are being enabled. So, so the vendors and, and Avid among them have had to have really had to rework their business model to the better now that you're out the other side of it over the past, say, two to three years. And you can see that in storage and, and not just with Abbott and bro- more broadly with how suppliers are looking to engage with customers. So hu- huge renaissance there. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great point. And then, you know, obviously we're here talking about storage and Nexus, of course, is very important to Avid and, and uh, certainly our customers. And, you know, when you think about all of these changes, right, all these market factors that we've kind of teed up here, talking through all the different changes, the massive amount of sort of pivoting going on and the adoption of all these different technologies out of necessity, you know, how do you, how do you uh, see that affecting storage strategies going forward in terms of right moving away from say the traditional, right. You know, on-prem, you know, sort of land connected universe to a more distributed environment uh, that could include cloud or, or other, other sort of technologies you're seeing and hearing from customers. 
so, so it, it's um it's beautiful to me and it, it's almost as if uh most of the early adopters that you would hold up as as kind of having that model of a next generation say storage architecture a, a lot of them are running from their uh disgust with their past installations you know uh as someone that kind of measures uh you know supplier or measures end user views on suppliers there hasn't there haven't been a lot of kind words for MAM vendors, right? All right. There haven't been a lot of kind words for anyone in asset management or, or orchestration. And and so you say, okay, we we spent five to 10 years trying to create these software monoliths that would solve every possible envision problem. Didn't work. Yeah, you know, we were unhappy, suppliers couldn't make any money, just didn't work. And so the, this next generation, and and at least my novice attempt to understand it when I you know see these individuals when when I see these professionals kind of talk through their their upcoming architectures, is they're creating these layers of abstraction, to to make it so the actual underlying storage doesn't have to be smart enough to know what's sitting on top of it as far as applications and vice versa the applications don't have to be don't have to actually have the intelligence of actually understanding the underlying storage layers. So so why does that matter? If you can actually pull it off and have these intelligent layers that are going to act as a go between, well you're you're now um you're you're not becoming beholden uh you're not becoming beholden to any kind of individual say either supplier tie-ins or tie-ins to any kind of legacy infrastructure and and you're kind of freed from those usual areas of frustration and you can explore as the business case warrants it, moving things into cloud environments, moving things into more traditional you know, uh, online uh, storage environments, or moving things into archive layers. And you can start to put intelligence in there to really optimize that. And then, you know, vice versa, in the application layer, you can start to do kind of similar things. And and to me, the 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 what what I would love, and, and maybe this is a, a comment to see how this podcast uh, evolves. You know, to, to me that um, if you tie it back to what I was saying about budgeting, you know, this this idea, this anachronism of we're going to have like, you know, semi-annual or yearly kind of bu- budget reviews to decide what we're going to need over the next year or next two years. That, that's that's smoking on a plane. It's something that's like historical that's over with. And you have you have to move that to much more of, OK, we need to do something or we're using something and we need to pay for it then or we need to kind of budget on that that basis. So you're pushing this decisioning, I think lower and low, lower is maybe the wrong word. Maybe you're pushing it into the actual users of that technology. So you, you could see a world where, you know, the, the, the decision to how much do I keep from, you know, this, uh, this production shoot, how much of that footage do I keep? If you could actually expose what the cost is to the individual that's making the decision, now they can make a much more informed decision. Hey, maybe I don't need all this, you know, all these ancillary camera feeds. Maybe that can just be lost to history. Uh, or, you know, maybe you can go the other direction and say, no, no, that that cost, that's that's worth it. And you think of it in a sporting environment. Do I need all these camera angles? So to, to me, to start to inject that type of information into decision-making and that decision-making at the point of the even the creative person or the business decision maker, that 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 to me holds such promise, um, and I keep coming back to, and it would really highlight the value of tech. I always want to make sure I get that that last part in. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and that's uh, that's great too. And I think that what you were saying around the software uh, and sort of how much of what used to be in hardware has moved into software defined storage solution offerings, which is certainly what Nexus has done. Um, lends itself well also to the business models too that people are starting to sort of gravitate towards, as you mentioned as well earlier. Um, it also leads me to sort of the next question. When, when you think about that service in terms of metadata enrichment and being able to search for and find content, at the end of the day, right, a, a, a library of media without any way to find it is, is nothing, right? So uh, the metadata component and the, and the enhancement and enrichment of that and the automation of that, right, are things that I think also become maybe a little bit easier to implement, right? Uh, if you have a, a solution like a software-defined storage solution that also can extend easily to a cloud where services like that are available. Are you seeing any of those things becoming reality in real style workflows? Yeah, yes. And I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting the critical thinking those tools are, again, kind of bringing to what makes sense in terms of, say, an archive strategy. My, my question, because I know it's, it's uh, there, there's, there's very little pushback when people get up and talk about the importance of metadata. But if that is going to be a science, my question to the giants of that kind of body of, of knowledge is 
how does one know what the appropriate amount of metadata is or how much, how does one know if what is good metadata? Yeah. And, and, and I, I, because it's, it's one thing to say, Oh, just more, Oh, just, you know, have more and more and more. Okay. Okay. But again, we're, we're running a business here. We need to understand like, why is this good? You know, how can it be better? And, and I, I'm even starting to see that, that dialogue, um, you know, emerging. So some people would point to, okay, what does it allow me to do is, is you were going to right? how fast can I retrieve things? How fast can I find things? And, 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 and maybe we can even start to understand, Hey, if we've had something sitting around for 20 years that we've never used, maybe it can go to a different tier, tier of storage. Right. So right. Um, right. It, it's all um, anyway, I know I'm kind of all over the place on that one, but to me, it's, it's a kind of a great sort of test of how serious we're getting when we have some, some honest questions and discussions about what constitutes good metadata, what constitutes good strategy. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think it, it, it is evolving to the point where, uh, you know, it almost doesn't matter necessarily to the end user where that piece of content may be re residing, just as long as they can find it. Right. And, and I think that that speaks to what you're just saying, which is, you know, if we're, uh, you know, really thinking hard about how to extract the right metadata to enable that to happen, it doesn't necessarily have to be everything, but it has to be the right things um, in order to enable that style of workflow. And that I think gives a lot of freedom to the people who are doing these types of deployments. Well said. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> uh, I guess the last thing I would ask, uh, Josh, because this has been fantastic. Um, what does Democroft hear and or see in terms of forward-looking technologies that might uh, you know, be big inflection points that are on the horizon that might further impact someone's sort of thinking around storage and storage strategies? So uh, I'm, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I guess <laughs> I, I would I'd want to be kind of consistent with my earlier observation because I, I, I actually do genuinely believe it. We're, we're almost at a point where we should have non-technology technology discussions in our world, right? Well, I feel like we have the tools and the agency to really advance the art of, and, and storage is, is right at the kind of pointed you know, uh, tip of the spear of of what I'm trying to get at, which is you have this you have this convergence of how people budget for, buy, deploy, and understand the success of technology, and how do suppliers put proper business models around that to make customers happy and to have enough money left over to actually invest in in future R and D, yep. and and that's why I, I I would just go back to. To me, that improvement of the dialogue between the people that are deploying, say, storage solutions and the people that are authorizing budgets, as that becomes closer and more productive, to me, that's going to unleash much larger pools of investment than any given technology that's a bit faster or flashier or you know, more exciting to talk about. So I know it's, it's kind of the boring accountant answer. But I, I just I can't stress enough how important I think that element is to unlock to unlock future investment. Yep, no, that's a good that's a good point. Um, well, Josh, this has been amazing. Uh, I want to thank you for you know uh, your expertise and your insights. Um, and again, you know you're doing this every single day, right? You're you're examining the market, and again, there's a limited amount of availability in terms of companies that do what you guys do. So it's extremely appreciated. Um, and so. We really value your input here. And I want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Um, if you want to you know, learn more about Devoncroft, where should folks uh, go, Josh? Well, uh, we we regularly publish uh, analysis on market developments on our blog, so devoncroft.com. Uh, but of course, for those that are kind of truly dedicated, do we have some nice lengthy reports uh, that they could file through? Yeah, excellent. Well, Josh, thanks again. Appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you soon. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ray. All right. Thanks. <laughs>